Hi, uh, my name is uh, David Villar. I teach uh, pharmacology in a veterinary school in the country of Colombia. And this talk is going to be the first of a series that will try to cover the basis of the most common problems in dogs and cats, uh, which can be uh, very uh, frustrating, but also very uh, rewarding. Uh, and I like to start by saying that uh, diagnosing and treating the cause of diarrhea is not an exact science by any stretch of imagination. Uh, because uh, many times we don't really know what we're uh, treating for and the role of many things that can cause diarrhea is not always uh, clear as we will see uh, for infectious organisms. So uh, on this uh, first uh, presentation uh, we're going to walk through the steps that could be taken in trying to make a diagnosis uh, which uh, in reality can also be applied to any other uh, clinical uh, problems uh, regardless of what those uh, may be. So the first thing in a problem-oriented approach is going to be uh, gathering information from the history uh, provided by the owner and obviously your own uh, initial uh, physical exam. Uh, then ideally you want to identify and list all the problems uh, and establish uh, rule outs for those uh, problems. And uh, to help you organize your thoughts and making sure you don't forget any uh, category of disease, uh, you can use uh, schemes like uh, the one shown here uh, with the acronym of uh, DAMIT, uh, the same as the idiom that we use uh, when we're uh, angry or annoyed. And then uh, from there you, you want to design a, a diagnostic plan based on the likely uh, differential diagnosis. And this should be uh, prioritized uh, based on the clinical sever severity of each problem uh, that the patient has, as well as obviously the client consent and whatever uh, financial uh, constraints he may have. So when you have uh, done your uh, pre preliminary uh, results, uh, you either establish a diagnosis or you simply uh, redefine your differentials and then follow them up accordingly until you are confident uh, of what's uh, really going on on the animal. Now I'm not going to uh, define diarrhea for you. I think we can all agree uh, it, that is basically the passage of uh, feces with an excess of water. Uh, that usually results in high volumes of uh, uh, unsightly uh, stool and uh, usually they come along with a greater uh, frequency of defecations. Now what's really helpful to begin with is being able to classify uh, the diarrhea in some way. Uh, if we talk about uh, functional uh, categorization this is something that is not routinely done but uh, as we will see for the other ones, uh, it may be very helpful determining the cause of diarrhea and obviously the treatment. The diarrhea can arise from an osmotic effect uh, by things that retain water in the intestines or it could be from an alteration on the permeability of the intestinal mucosa uh, when there is damage or some type of uh, inflammation or it could be a hypersecretory or because of some some uh, situation that is causing uh, increased uh, motility. I always uh, like to show this uh, picture uh, to illustrate something that you may not be aware of. If we were to talk about a, uh, say a 20 kilogram dog, there is going to be between 8 to 10 liters of fluid that goes in and out of the intestines every day, but usually by the end uh, the fluxes are going to be uh, almost equal and there is no net loss or gain of water and usually very little water is going to come up with uh, normal feces and that's obviously all going to change when we have diarrhea. If the diarrhea is uh, hypersecretory, uh, the volume going in is going to be so great that it cannot all be absorbed uh, uh, further down the intestine and in this situation the loss of water uh, will definitely cause a potential uh, lethal uh, dehydration as opposed to this type of uh, diarrhea, uh, when we talk about osmotic, osmotic diarrhea, in this uh, case there is no change in the water going in the intestines, but what's uh, affected is the absorption, uh, whatever uh, osmotic substances are holding up that water, and in this uh, situation that diarrhea is usually not as severe in terms of uh, causing uh, de dehydration. Uh, what we're uh, most uh, used to uh, is uh, talking how long that diarrhea has been going on. If it is more than three weeks, we usually say it's uh, chronic. And that's important because uh, in most acute cases uh, of diarrhea, they tend to be uh, self-limiting. Uh, 
and patients are often going to get better despite of what we do and not because of what we're doing and a good example would be a dietary indiscretion and there there is also another uh, classification based on the location in the intestines uh, whether it's a uh, large or small bowels and you've probably seen this uh, chart here uh, before uh, most patients will tend to fall in, under one category or the other and this can really narrow the list of uh, things that will cause diarrhea uh, with small bowel uh, diarrhea there is usually a, a much greater uh, loss of fluids uh, with the stool uh, these are usually expelled a, a few times a day, two, four at the most, and usually affects the condition of the animal uh, to a greater extent than with uh, large bowel diarrhea. And in chronic cases, uh, if it is uh, from small bowel, that animal is definitely going to lose weight because it cannot retain water uh, nutrients. And uh, in co by contrast, uh, if we talk about uh, large bowel diarrhea, this is uh, characterized by more, more frequent uh, small uh, small amounts of uh, stool. Uh, there is usually increased urgency, uh, tenesmus, which is that straining that you might see when the animal is defecating. And we can even see a mucus or even a frank hemorrhage uh, in the stool sample. So uh, once we have uh, classified the diarrhea, uh, we usually put it together with all the other information that we have uh, gathered from the owner and the physical exam and that usually inclu includes uh, questions like the progression of the diarrhea uh, the appearance of the diarrhea and here it's always uh, helpful uh, to use some type of uh, fecal score uh, chart like the one you see here uh, at least to determine how severe that diarrhea might be obviously any changes in diet environment uh, whether the animal is been in a kennel or uh, recently uh, uh, been in a shelter or uh, uh, traveling it's always these are always important clues as to uh, what might be going on in the animal uh, it's not the same an adult dog that is been in a fenced uh, yard as a puppy for example that is uh, visiting uh, dog parks or puppy classes Obviously, the medical history is important if there has been any uh, previous illnesses. Uh, the deworming and vaccination history can rule out uh, intest intestinal parasites and infections like uh, feline polycopenia or uh, 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 canine uh, purple virus. Uh, if there are other pets in the household, you probably want to put contagious agents at the top of the list. And uh, last but not least, uh, if there are any other signs that that uh, could indicate an, an extra intestinal origin to the diarrhea that's obviously uh, going to be important. If we list the minimum database uh, for a patient with diarrhea it should probably include a CBC, a serum chemistry panel and urinalysis uh, and this will definitely help you rule out uh, extra intestinal causes of diarrhea and it's obviously going to be important to uh, assess the met metabolic condition of the animal uh, whether it uh, needs uh, fluids and whether uh, the, anim the diarrhea is complicated uh, and he may have a septicemia and that, uh, that's why the CBC it's, uh, it becomes crucial uh, to get that information. Uh, as regards as, uh, fecal testing is definitely uh, mandatory here and I want to emphasize the importance of uh, collecting fresh uh, stool samples if you collect a, a stool from a litter box and it's desiccated or you collect it from a carpet and it's been there for uh, several days, it's probably not going to give you any good information. And in those situations, you might just want to uh, uh, do a rectal uh, flush with some saline and do the, the whatever testing you want to do out of the material that you might attain. Fecal flotation by uh, centrifugation is going to tell us a lot more uh, about the presence or the absence of roundworms, uh, hookworms, uh, as well as coccidia and cyst of uh, giardia. Uh, the giardia elisa is a lot more sensitive than doing uh, direct smears, but I'll have to say that uh, direct smears can definitely be should be in place because if you find giardia or trichomonas that's definitely not going to be a false positive and sometimes we can find a lot of neutrophins uh, to suggest uh, 
like a salmonella or a clostridium uh, infection. In cat, they usually suggest uh, uh, doing a fecal leukemia virus, uh, if you like an uh, immunosuppressive uh, virus, as well as uh, thyroid testing. If the animal is hyperthyroid, uh, the chances are that the diarrhea is going to be uh, secondary to the thyroid uh, problem. Now, there are other tests that, that are not included, obviously, in this uh, minimal database, and uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but if you don't come up with, with a diagnosis, you might want to do a radiograph, ultrasound, endoscopy, and uh, those techniques will probably tell you things that uh, you might not be able to pick up with the other techniques that I just uh, alluded at. So, uh, because uh, parasites are a very common cause of diarrhea, I think it's convenient to discuss them separate. And uh, I'm just showing here the Companion Animal Parasite Council, or uh, also known as uh, CAPSI. The website is, uh, provides uh, excellent guidelines uh, for the diagnosis, treatment, prevention, control of uh, both uh, internal and external uh, parasites. They usually recommend doing fecal screening for parasites two to four times a year if these are puppies or kittens, and at least one to two times uh, for, the, for the adults. Uh, they also suggest uh, doing uh, year-round uh, prevention with uh, antihelmintics uh, to prevent uh, new infections uh, from taking place, and they suggest uh, monthly uh, preventatives. Now, in my, in my opinion, and in light of the resistance that uh, at least is developing in large animal practice, uh, I think this uh, should probably be reconsidered if that uh, fecal exam is going to be negative. Uh, the one thing to mention is that the fecal uh, flotation by centrifugation is at least two to three times more sensitive than just doing a simple flotation. Uh, in other words, uh, if uh, there will be probably more eggs that will be recovered this way and therefore the chances of a false uh, negatives are, uh, are decreased. Just uh, to show you the relevance of uh, parasites, I want to uh, show this uh, prevalence uh, map uh, from CAPSI. And this is uh, definitely an excellent visual prop that you can show uh, owners uh, to illustrate the risk of infection in different states of the U.S that the owners don't see the parasites coming out of their pet's uh, poop does not really mean they're not infected and in fact uh, they, on, at least on the west, this uh, website they say that 9 out of 10 puppies under uh, uh, 3 months of age are likely to be infested so you just have to tell the, the owner that uh, w because the parasites are out of sight they shouldn't really be out of uh, their mind particularly considering that uh, uh, many of these parasites are uh, zoonotic uh, for humans. Now, most of the times, uh, these parasites, uh, as I say, will not cause disease, and you could say they're a hidden problem, And uh, but that's not always the case, uh, particularly in puppies and kittens that are more uh, vulnerable uh, to hookworms and roundworms than the adults. And here you can see some of the clues that should tip you off that the puppy is infected. Uh, interestingly, uh, they uh, miss diarrhea on this uh, diagram, so we should probably put that here in the picture. And uh, roundworms uh, are like uh, big thieves, they steal nutrients uh, from the animal needs. And if you see uh, this uh, distended, uh, bloated belly, you always have to think about roundworms. Uh, that the f some and sometimes you'll even see them being expelled with the vomit. Uh, and that, can, that sometimes happens because there are so many in the intestine that they just don't feed and they have to go and reside in the stomach. Now if we talk about the other uh, group of, uh, of uh, important worms, uh, the hookworms are another uh, elements that we have to consider. And these are definitely uh, uh, probably more dangerous than the previous ones because even though they're uh, smaller in size, they're usually found in uh, really large numbers and uh, they're like uh, little vampires that suck blood from the intestines and I'll have to say that I've done necropsies in adult dogs that die with severe anemia and I found so many of these guys in the large bowels that uh, is something that uh, I at least I keep in mind uh, when I have an animal with uh, anemia and at least uh, large bowel diarrhea.
So now let's uh, further re refine the fecal tests that are uh, commercially available, can definitely help us uh, get closer to a diagnosis. Uh, there is always the classical fecal cultures that uh, can isolate a specific bacteria. The downside is that uh, normal animals can be carriers of the same bacteria, so interpreting the results is not always going to be straightforward. Uh, if you get a pure uh, heavy growth, it's more likely to be significant. The turnaround time is uh, between 3 and, and 12 days, so uh, in the meantime you may have to treat empirically. And in the next slide we will discuss the real-time PCR, which is now available. Uh, with uh, laboratories like IDEX and they offer really a lot of advantages uh, that were not available until now. Uh, there is also uh, the fecal in-house ELISAs and as you can see here uh, we can detect parvovirus, uh, Giardia, Cryptosporidium and uh, obviously uh, you can get uh, an immediate answer with these uh, quick uh, essays. And uh, with regards to the real-time PCR um, by IDEX. I'll have to say that uh, at least uh, they don't require any uh, special media, so uh, as opposed to uh, fecal cultures. Uh, the, the turnaround time is a lot quicker, uh, one to three days, and the panels also include, include other agents, uh, at least uh, viral and uh, protozoas, that uh, you cannot really detect with the other ones. And usually the same drawback uh, uh, as cultures applies here in the way that uh, normal animals may also harbor these organisms. And I will show you a study in just a moment uh, to illustrate this. Uh, the, the good thing about these panels is that you can see, uh, you can detect a lot of organisms in just uh, one test and obviously that uh, becomes uh, cost effective. If we look at these uh, consensus, consensus uh, paper that was put together by the animal, uh, uh, by, excuse me, by the American College of uh, Veterinary Internal uh, Medicine. It basically tells us that there are a lot of asymptomatic carriage, uh, which means that the infection uh, will not always cause disease. Uh, so uh, if you see uh, the prevalence here, it's pretty high in normal animals. Obviously that varies from one study to another. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, the cause of diarrhea could be nothing related to uh, any of the organisms that we're uh, detecting, and yet uh, that can definitely lead us to a mis uh, misdiagnose what's uh, truly going on. At least in acute cases, uh, most of these infections are going to be self-limiting uh, in nature, so uh, just keep that in mind. That so here is a recent study that, sh that again shows that the presence of uh, potential pathogens is not enough to establish a diagnosis. Uh, in this case, they look at uh, 169 puppies of less than a year old with, with and without uh, acute diarrhea of less than one day of uh, duration. And they screen for all the pathogens that you see on the list. And I'll have to say that except for Salmonella, the prevalence of most of those those pathogens was uh, similar or very close in both uh, healthy puppies and those uh, with diarrhea. So if we look at this other uh, study, in here they look at 100 uh, cats uh, with diarrhea. They did the real-time PCR for eight uh, enteropathogenic species. Coronavirus uh, was present in 60% of the samples. Uh, I, I don't think this is a, a pathogenic organism, as far as I am aware, uh, unless maybe if you have a systemic uh, feline infectious peritonitis, 56% uh, uh, of the samples were uh, positive for the gene that produces the toxin of Clostridium perfringens, and about 20% uh, had either uh, parvovirus, Giardia, Trichomonas, or uh, Cristosporidium. So, uh, <laughs> With this uh, many pathogens involved, uh, you may wonder, well, how do I decide what's uh, truly important? Um, well, if you have Salmonella or Toxoplasma, that's uh, more likely to be the real thing because uh, neither one of these two organisms should be present uh, to begin with. And if we look at this uh, other uh, graph, uh, uh, most of the cats had either two or three or even four different pathogens. So uh, looking at this, uh, you start wondering uh, which one may be the real or the evil one, or should, should I just treat for both of them at the same time? 
With regards to uh, trichomonas, uh, it's kind of a party organism. It doesn't like to be on its own, so to speak. So, uh, and uh, it could definitely cause uh, uh, diarrhea. So it's one of those organisms that uh, sometimes you treat for everything else uh, except for this one, and until you get this one on board, you're not really gonna take care of that diarrhea. So really from a practical standpoint, it really, it's really difficult and you don't always know what to treat for. And as we will see uh, when we talk about treatments, uh, many times uh, the diagnosis is going to be made uh, based on the response to uh, the different treatments. So if we, uh, we have said that identifying a pathogenic organism is not enough. Uh, I think I got that point across. But there are additional tests that uh, can increase the chances of getting closest, closer to a real diagnosis. So I want to show you this example in which uh, they compare different assays to see whether uh, Clostridium perfringens may be associated with the diarrhea in dogs. And as you can see, the organism was again cultured in a lot of dogs, uh, up to 70% uh, of them, uh, whether they had diarrhea or not. But uh, only 14% of those uh, without diarrhea were positive for the presence of the enterotoxin, as compared to 34%. And when we combine the presence of the gene that goes uh, for that uh, toxin by PCR, uh, then the uh, there were uh, only 4% uh, four four percent of the dogs uh, without diarrhea that were positive, as opposed to 28% uh, uh, that had diarrhea. Now again, obviously, uh, you cannot tell whether uh, the Clostridium perfringens is the primary cause of the diarrhea. Uh, this is just an association which doesn't, which, uh, doesn't imply a cause and effect relationship. And that's the reason why I said uh, earlier that uh, a diagnosing diarrhea is not an exact science uh, like it could be for uh, other type of diseases. And to show you a clear example of what I mean by primary and secondary cause of diarrhea, let's take a look at this uh, other study. Here they had five dogs with uh, chronic uh, recurring uh, diarrhea. They were all positive for Clostridium difficile infection and in all of the five cases, they also uh, identified or detected the toxins of the organism, and they did uh, not respond to the treatment with uh, metronidazole. Well, in this case, all the animals responded when the diet was changed, uh, and that basically indicates that there is a food allergy or some kind of intolerance of some constituent in that food, and that was uh, definitely the main cause or the primary cause of diarrhea. So the conclusion in this case was that the, the disruption of that microflora uh, caused by the uh, offending uh, diet had allowed the proliferation of the Clostridium difficile and that was a secondary event and until that uh, you change the diet and get, uh, get that uh, offending uh, constituent out of the diet, uh, that inflammation in the intestine is not going to resolve and the Clostridium is probably going just to uh, take advantage of that. Now, uh, to end the presentation, we're going to see how we should approach a diagnosis of chronic diarrhea, and you will see why classifying the diarrhea into acute or chronic becomes important. So if, w if I were to ask you a poll question, what would you think are the main causes of chronic diarrhea uh, that you probably see in practice? Well, uh, the infections uh, definitely are going to take a second seat or second row seat, uh, so to speak, and the answer here is going to be dietary, uh, that is causing some kind of inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, on this study, uh, in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine, the objective was precisely to evaluate the underlying causes of diarrhea of uh, more than three weeks of duration in uh, 136 dogs. In the, in the introduction, they mentioned that uh, non-infectious uh, conditions seem to be the main cause in most other studies. And the term uh, non-infectious inflammatory bowel disease is used to refer to uh, those uh, type of diarrhea that respond to a change in diet. And if that doesn't work, it could, they could also be an antibiotic responsive diarrhea. And when there is no uh, response to neither one of those two, then they may be responsive to an anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressive drug
and they call this last one an idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. So regardless of which, which is the origin for these uh, three types of entero enteropathies, if you were to, to do a biopsy, uh, basically the histological evaluation will not be able to distinguish between any of the three. Uh, and that's uh, the only way of uh, making a diagnosis is going to be by response to uh, sequential uh, uh, treatment trials. So in this case, uh, they started with uh, 209 dogs, but in the end, only uh, 136 met, met the criteria of having a minimum uh, workup. And in those uh, 136, uh, they could make a final diagnosis with uh, good confidence. So basically, they took a stepwise approach uh, uh, to characterize uh, the non-infectious inflammatory uh, enteropathy. Uh, and that was, as I say, based on the response to treatment. They started with an elimination diet for at least uh, four to eight weeks. And if there was no improvement, they introduced antibiotics for at least 10 days. Uh, they used either uh, metronidazole or tylosine. And if that didn't work, uh, they were put on prednisone or uh, cyclosporine to see if it was a, a steroid-responsive uh, enteropathy. So uh, as you can see, this other slide, 90% of the animals had a primary enteropathy. In other words, the origin was uh, within the intestines, and 10% uh, had a, an extra intestinal uh, cause to the diarrhea. Now, the most uh, common primaries uh, were non-infectious uh, inflammatory diarrhea with 71%. And of those uh, 71 percent, 66 uh, were uh, diet responsive. Uh, now, whether the nature is allergic or simple uh, food intolerance, uh, where there is no immune system involved, uh, obviously that could not be determined uh, with uh, the essays they did. And uh, they point that uh, some animals had a skin disease and itching, and that would obviously point to a work towards uh, an allergy. Now, what I found interesting is that only 13% uh, were infectious, and there were, and these were mostly uh, caused by uh, Giardia. Uh, if you look at other studies, you'll probably see that Giardia is a much uh, bigger player in uh, chronic diarrhea. Uh, they didn't report any uh, bacterial causes, uh, even though they looked for most of them, and they attributed this uh, basically to the fact that that bacteria is usually uh, a self-limiting uh, diarrhea. In other words, if you have a, an acute diarrhea, you definitely want to include the bacteria, but not so much if you have a chronic diarrhea. Also, uh, only uh, four dogs were uh, less than one year of age, uh, which are definitely the ages that you would expect to find diarrhea caused by uh, roundworms and hookworms. Uh, so from this study, we cannot really exclude uh, big worms as an important cause of diarrhea. And uh, it may also be that uh, the study was done in Berlin, uh, in Germany, uh, and uh, I, it could be that the owners are really conscientious uh, doing uh, preventive uh, treatments uh, with, uh, with uh, antihelmintics. And it could also be that there are not many stray dogs in the city to keep the population of roundworms around. So who knows uh, why they didn't detect really any uh, big worms uh, on this study. As you can see, 13% uh, were diagnosed as antibiotic responsive diarrhea, and 23% had, had uh, idiopathic uh, inflammatory disease. Uh, lymphoma accounted for 4% uh, and was the most uh, frequent uh, neoplastic disease. And of the secondary enteropathies, uh, uh, Exocrine uh, pancreatic deficiency was the most frequent. Uh, there were uh, other endocrine disorders like thyroid and adrenal uh, problems. Uh, these accounted for a few cases. And finally, uh, you have to include liver, kidney, and heart diseases that could also be associated with diarrhea. So as you can see, uh, for chronic diarrhea, uh, the diagnosis is going to require basically a stepwise uh, therapeutic trial uh, with an elimination diet and many will also need to go through an antibiotic or an anti-inflammatory uh, drug trial uh, to see if, if they fall into any of those uh, other two categories. So in summary, uh, searching for the causes of diarrhea uh, should kind of follow a problem-oriented approach. Uh, classifying the type of diarrhea and doing a minimum workup should be performed 
uh, before we can come up with a list of differentials. Uh, acute diarrheas tend to be self-limiting, but they can be life-threatening if they are not treated uh, properly. Uh, with uh, chronic diarrheas, remember that the diagnosis uh, is most of the times made based on the response to an elimination diet uh, first. And if that doesn't uh, work, uh, which is the most uh, common cause, then you may have to go into antibiotics uh, or a trial with uh, immunosuppressive uh, drugs. Just keep in mind that uh, with both uh, acute and chronic diarrhea, uh, the treatment response is going to be essential to establish a definitive diagnosis because as uh, you just saw, there are multiple things that could be going on at the same time and that's why it's not an exact science. And finally, uh, we have not really talked about uh, how all the clinical and clean path results uh, become important, uh, at least uh, to establish a prognosis. Uh, we'll probably address that uh, in more detail on the following uh, video. So this is the final slide. I don't know if you may be more confused now than you were before. Uh, this is a topic that can be addressed in many different ways. Uh, and it makes it quite daunting explaining in just a short video. So I hope at least I have uh, provided some tidbits uh, that will help you reach in a diagnosis in whatever cases uh, you're uh, confronted with. So again, thanks for uh, watching this presentation and bye-bye uh, for now.